So last time we looked at some fashion trends throughout the century, and today we are going to look at haircuts throughout the century. Now, before I start with the PowerPoint, I just want you to know there are way more things, and I don't know if this is fair, but there are way more things out there for women's haircuts than for men. And you're going to see the, f the first beginning is all women, but don't worry, guys, I found us some haircuts. But I don't know, I guess the internet just likes women haircuts more. But we start out in the... Now, man, I, I don't know about you, but it's hard enough to do my hair in the morning, let alone put a wig on. And I don't know how they could do that in the Texas summer. I don't know. And then you have the good old-fashioned mullet. The good old-fashioned mullet. And then today, you have the hair bun. And those are the trends. I have friends, and this is their hairstyle. And you see, there's all these different kind of trends. But today, we are going to look at a trend that you and I want to break. And it comes from this, uh, this quote from the Christian Post. I'd like to read it for you again. It says, A full 72% of people interviewed said they think that the church is full of hypocrites. But it continues, said, But at the same time, however, 71% of the respondents said that they believe Jesus makes a positive difference in a person's life. And 78% said they'd be willing to listen to someone who wanted to share what they believe about Christianity. And my friends, we see this trend where 72% of the world thinks that the church is full of hypocrites, but guess what? 78% would like to learn about Jesus Christ. And we see this trend of this big disconnect, and we are going to look at how Jesus says we can fix it. And last time, our first part, we looked at the first step is that we have to work on our vertical relationship with Jesus Christ. We can make sure that there is nothing that we are holding on in our hearts that will be between us and Jesus Christ. And now today, as we continue in the Sermon on the Mount, we are going to look about our relationship with others. Because you see, you cannot love God if you don't love others. Let me say that again. You cannot love God if you do not love others. So go with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and we're starting verse 33. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 33. And when you get there, give me an amen. Amen. <clears throat> and it says, Again you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oath to the Lord. Verse 34. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one here white or black, but let your yes be yes, and your no be no. For whatever is more than this is from the evil one. And so today we're going to look at, this is the third illustration so far in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus gives his own spiritual interpretation to the law. 
Because we're going to see that the Jews, they had taken their eyes off a relationship of God, and they had focused on the law. And you see, they're both, you need the relationship and you need the law, because if you love Jesus, you will follow his commandments. And so what's interesting is we're going to look at today because we can be morally good people, but not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to look at Jesus is trying to take us a step further. And so first I'd like us to look at the time of the Jewish people because he says, you have heard it been said. And I want you to take you back in the Bible where you see that Jesus isn't getting this out of thin air. He is quoting scripture. So go back with me to Numbers chapter 30. Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. And when you get there, give me an amen. 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 So at Numbers chapter 30, verse 2, it says, If a man makes a vow to the Lord, or swears an oath to bind himself by some argument, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all the proceeds out of his mouth. But now I want you to go with me to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 12. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 12. (laughs) Leviticus chapter 19, verse 12 says, And you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. But I want us to look at one more verse. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy chapter 23. Starting in verse 21 to 23. So Deuteronomy chapter 23. And there's a reason for this. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 21 to 23. And it says, When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it would be sin to you. But if you abstain from vowing, it shall not be sin to you. That which has gone from your lips you shall keep and perform, for you voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have perf- promised with your mouth. And now go back, back with me to Matthew, because there's a reason. We're putting all this together because we see that what Jesus is saying is from the Old Testament. This isn't anything new, but I want to show you that the Jews had found loopholes in the law. Because you see, and I, I love, I'm reading out the New King James Version, but it says to not swear. Going back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, it says to not swear falsely. And some may just say to vow or to oath or not to make a, or to swear. And you see, the reason it's just so important because the Greek word used here literally translates to swear falsely. And there's a reason for this. And first we got to see, you know, for them to, to swear is different than nowadays. If someone says, oh, he was swearing, you're thinking maybe it was a bad word. But you see here, to make a swear was to make a promise. And the Jews had found loopholes to get out of their promises. Now, I don't know about you, but if you have a friend or a family member who makes a promise to, to you, you want them to keep it, right? Nothing's worse than having someone who time after time after time breaks a promise. If they say, I promise, will you believe them? No. Because of their history, they keep breaking all their promises. How, how can you trust them? And you see, the Jews had made loopholes to get out of promises, even to God. And I don't want you just to take my word for it. I want you to take God's word for it. So go with me to Matthew. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, starting in verse 16. Matthew chapter 23, verse 16. When you get there, give me an amen. Because we see here, it says, Woe to you blind guides who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obligated to perform it. Do you see that? 
But let's continue because it just gets worse. Verse 17, fools and blind for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? Verse 18, and whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obligated to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift on, or, the, or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Verse 20, therefore he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. Then verse 22, and he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Did you see what happened? And during that time, the Jewish leaders taught, oh, if you swear by heaven, it's okay. But if you swear by money, you got to pay up. And you see, they had lost the sight of the relationship with materialistic objects. And I want you to know, looking back at this even more, they believed that if you made a promise and you could say, I swear by Jerusalem, you could get out of it. But if you swore by God, they said you can't get out of that. And the reason is, the rationale for thinking this is because if you swore by God, God is now a partner in your promise. Does that make sense? So since you swore by God, you and God are now partners in this promise. But if you just swore by heaven or swore by Jerusalem, you, oh, it doesn't matter. But my friends, I want you to know that as Christians, everything we say and do, we are in partnership with God. And before we continue, I just want to make a clarification because it says, do not make oaths. And some, some religious groups have taken this as saying that we can't, when we go to like the judge, that we can't swear by oath. And that we're not going to go there, but if you go to Matthew chapter 26, verse 63 and 64, we see that Jesus, when the rulers, <coughs> um, were, or the, uh, the teachers and the rulers were asking him who he was, they made him swear. And he says, I am he. And he, and he tells them, I am Jesus Christ. I am the Son of God. So we see here that Jesus did swear, did make an oath. But at the same time, and I just share that because there have been people or groups who say, well, I can't, when I go before court, I can't make an oath. Jesus made an oath. But going back, my friends, everything we do, we are in partnership with God. If I make a promise with you, by golly, I need to keep it. If I make a promise with God, guess what? I need to keep it. And I want to share a story with you. When I was young, I went to uh, the Burleson Adventist School. I hadn't heard of Cleburne. I went to Cleburne. But I went to the Burleson Adventist School, and I was in first grade. And I, you know, I was a pretty good kid, but I had this time, this section of time in first grade where you could just say, I really racked up some frequent flyer miles to the principal's office. <laughs> but you know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't my fault, uh, kind of. You see, my buddy and I, you know, we'd be minding our own business, and there was this one young man in our class who was the instigator. And for my teachers out there, you already know what I'm talking about. And there was this instigator, and we would just be playing. They used to have this monkey bar that was like a dome. Have you ever seen one of those? Like, it's a dome, and you climb up to the very top and climb down. Well, we'd be playing on it. you climb up and you climb down. And this instigator, this, this young man, he would come, and at one time he grabbed my buddy's head because we would play a game where someone would be in the middle. And you have to climb up and touch the top before he tags you or you're it. And he was getting frustrated because he couldn't tag us. And, you know, we're boys. And so long story short, he grabs my buddy's head and slams it into the monkey bars. And on later times, I would just be standing there and he would slam me into this stuff. And you know what? My buddy and I, we hadn't, li hadn't read the scripture. We hadn't le listened to the sermon because guess what us as upright Christian young man did? We got back at him. So he slammed us. We go push him. We would punch him. But you see, he was smart because as soon as we did this, guess what he would do? He'd go to the teacher. <laughs> He'd go to the teacher. And I, I did the line that almost every first grader has ever used. He started it. And you know what? We would get a straight ticket to the principal's office. But I tell you the story because I remember to this day, 
I'd walk into the principal's office like, "Uh uh-oh. His name was Mr. May. And he would sit me down and he would say, Austin, I know that you are a trustworthy young man. Just tell me the truth. And with an intro like that as a first grader, you know what I did? I told him the truth. The good and the bad. And you know what? Jesus, in the same way, as we are Christians, as we are his ambassadors here on earth, he comes to each and every one of us and says, I trust you to show the world who I am. I trust you to be trustworthy. So as Christians, our yes should be yes, and our no should be no. And I'd just like to share with you what an old philosopher by the, by the name of Isocrates used to say. He said, a man must lead a life which will gain more confidence in him than ever an oath can do. My friends, as Christians, we need to live a life where, we, where the world can know that we are trustworthy. Because my friend in this world, there are so many people that are fake. There are so many people that don't keep their promises, that are doing stuff not the way they're supposed to. But as Christians, when our yes is yes and our no and no, people will look at us and say, what do they have? And our answer is Jesus Christ. But let's continue. Go back with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 38. And when you get there, give me an amen. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other. So what's interesting here is an eye for an eye. This was a common a common saying, and you'll read in the Old Testament that throughout Jesus says, or the, the law said, an eye for an eye. And why this is amazing, because some people look at the Old Testament like, wow, wasn't that brutal? But you got to imagine, before this law was put in place, if you broke my arm, my friends and my family would kill your whole family. So you got to remember the times that we're living in, and even more, the Babylonians used to have a law, and it was the same, about the same as an eye for an eye, but they broke it down into two categories. And this is the, the earliest law they could find about this. And the two categories were there were gentlemen and workmen. So let's say you accidentally, you're working, and you actually, your hammer flies off, and you hit someone, or you hit their eye, and they, your, their eye's messed up. If it's a gentleman, it's an eye for an eye. There goes your eye. But if it's a poor person or a workman, as they categorized it, all you had to do was give them money. All you had to do was give them money. But what's so interesting is the way that God meant for it to be, the Jews, when they are living, they actually, if you hurt somebody by their law, you would have to go to the judge. Because it says an eye for an eye, but the goal was for you not just to go out and get revenge on your own, but for you to go to the judge. And as a Jew, you would have to pay for five things. One, you'd have to pay for the injury, for the pain the person is going through, for healing. So all the, the cost for medicine, you'd have to pay for. You'd have to pay for their loss of time, and you'd have to pay for their humiliation and being hurt. And you see, that's the way God meant for it to be. But he wants us to take it a step further, doesn't he? Because you know in our, in our lives, there are going to be times when people— People do some mean things to us. Because we get to the part where it talks about if someone slaps you, what do you do? You turn the other cheek. And we think about this. If someone, if I'm right-handed. If I slap someone and they turn the other cheek, how am I going to hit them? Am I going to use my left hand or am I going to use my back hand? My back hand, right? And you know, in Jewish culture, to use your back hand was twice the insult. It's one thing to get slapped. Now, I don't know about you, but being slapped uh, isn't fun. But to be backhanded, to be slapped with the backside of your hand was a doubly insult. And Jesus said, just let it happen. Turn the other cheek. And, and I share this with you because any of us who've ever been slapped, when I was in high school, there were a few girls that I think they enjoyed it. 
And I don't know about you, but if you've ever been slapped, my parents taught me never to hit a girl. But there have been a few times when I got slapped that I thought about it. I'm not proud of it, but when you get slapped, you're like, ugh. But my friends, you and I, we may not, well, I pray not every day get slapped in the face. I pray not. But every day we will have people who with their words or actions will slap us in the face. And as Christians, we have two choices. To get our hand up or get our words out and try to destroy their character or turn the other cheek. And I share this with you because I know in my life, and you've probably seen it before, the hardest thing to do when someone's attacking your character, when people are saying bad things about you, is to stay quiet and turn the other cheek. And I share this with you because there was a time when I was at college when someone was attacking my character. And it was the hardest thing where I was like, oh, it's not true. I just want to say this. And I just did. But to turn the other cheek, to turn the other cheek, that was God has called us to do. And I know in your works and your lives, you have people who may be attacking your character, may be physically or emotionally slapping you. But my friends, turn the other cheek. Because when you turn the other cheek, the people around you will say, what? What does that person have? Why is he just turning or she just turning the other cheek? I want that. Now continue with me in the Bible. Go with, go with me to verse 40. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Now, this is an interesting verse. Because you see, if you'll go with me to Exodus chapter 22, Go with me to Exodus chapter 22. Exodus chapter 22, verse 26. Give me an amen when you get there. Amen. It says, If you ever take your neighbor's garment as a pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. Verse 27, For it is his only covering, it is his garment for his skin, what will he sleep in? And what will it be that when he cries to me, I will hear, for I am gracious. So going back to here, when we, when we read this, you know, we can understand if someone wants your shirt, give him your coat also, but in the Jewish mindset, they had a tunic, which is like our shirts. And most people would have multiple ones. But your cloak or your garment, most people only had one. And you see, his garment was, was a piece of clothing that you would wear every single day. But not only that, at night, this garment became your blanket. And so as you looked in Exodus, according to the law, according to the law, they had to give it back to you by night. So even if they took your garment by night, they had to give it back to you so you could sleep. But here Jesus is saying, if someone wants to sue you, give them your tunic or your shirt and your jacket. Now, why would Jesus say that? Well, you see here, can you imagine something happens and a Jewish man is suing another Jewish man. He says, I, I want my money and da-da-da-da. And you give him your tunic, but you say, you know what? Have my coat too. One, they will know that you are a man of integrity. And that you mean what you say. And two, I want us to imagine, put this in real today example. Um, our chorister, Dr. Aaron Moses. For anybody who knows him, he drives a sweet ride. So I want you to imagine one day I, I come to Dr. Moses and I said, Hey, can I borrow your car? And he says, Yeah, sure. And so he allows me to borrow his car and I, I get in and I start joyriding. Start joyriding, having the time of my life. And long story short, I total his car. I total his car. Now, you know, as we've read, it could be, you know, he could be like, you know, it's an eye for an eye. And he goes to total my car. But as a Christian, as a Christian, you know what we're supposed to do? 
Because you see here, give your tunic, but give your cloak also. We are to go the extra mile. So in real life example, if I totaled his car, what I would do, what as Christians we are to do, is to give, to pay for a rental, for, for him to drive, and to save up money so in the end, you can give him an even better car than he started with. Because my friends, as Christians, we are to be Christians of integrity. And when we mess up, when we do something wrong, we are supposed to go the extra mile. Because can you imagine, if I totaled his car and I did this, do you think he would still be mad at me for totaling his car? No. Because he knows that I made sure to make it right. And as Christians, when we mess up or when something happens, we need to make it right. And even more, we need to go the extra mile. And that leads me right into our next point. Verse 41, whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. And what's so powerful about this is during the time you could be out with your kids in front of your house, having a good time, then all of a sudden you feel the flat part of a spear on your shoulder. And that what they mean by compel. It's because you remember the Romans were in charge of the, of the area of the Jews, right? So when you felt the flat part of the spear on your shoulder, you by law had to carry their pack for at least one mile. And what Jesus is saying is if they tell you to go one mile, how many miles are you supposed to go? Two. But not only that, when we go the extra mile for them, are we to be complaining? Are we to be mad? No. We're supposed to show them the love that Jesus Christ has for them. And I share this with you because I know in your works and in our lives, we are going to have times where people put work and stuff on your plate that isn't yours to do. There is going to be time where people tell you to do stuff that you don't want to do, but as Christians, everything we do, we need to go the extra mile, and we need to do it graciously. We need to do it with sharing with them the love that Jesus Christ has for us. But continue with me. Verse 42. Give to him who asks you and from him who wants to borrow from you. Do not turn away. My friends, our, God has given us all we have. And, and God is our responsibility as Christians to give to others who are in need. But go with me to verse 43. It says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to, to you, to love your enemy. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your fathers in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the, on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Do not the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. And I want to share with you, as I was studying for this, I came across an old Jewish tale. And it, it takes you back to the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea. And I, I want to read it to you so that I don't misquote it or mis missay it. But it goes like this. As the Israelites escaped the death, uh, escaped death from the grips of the Egyptian king and crossed the Red Sea safely, and as the waves crashed down and destroyed the Egyptians, the angels in heaven gave a mighty shout and began to, in unison praising God. But God said, Stop. How can you sing to me as the workmanship of my hand are sunk in the sea? My friends, God takes no pleasure in the death or destruction of anyone. And so as Christians, when we have people who may be our enemy, people who are using us, who are persecuting us, who are attacking us, we are to love them. You know, and this is the opposite. Nowadays, if, if you see, it, it's a hard time to be a young person because nowadays they have all these different video games. And all the video games say, for your enemies, you are to kill and destroy them. But Jesus says you're to love them. 
And I want to flip the table real fast because sometimes it's so easy to be, do a them versus us, but I want you to look at yourself and your relationship with Jesus. My friends, are we easy to love? My friends, we're all sinners. And even more, when we sin, you know what we're doing? We are siding with the enemy. So when we sin, we are siding with the enemy. So that makes us enemies of God and Jesus Christ. But what does Jesus do? Does he get an atomic lightning bolt and struck us down? No. Jesus is there with his arms wide open and says, come back to me. Come back to me. And my friends, can we not show the world the love that Jesus has shown us? Because while we were still sinners, Christ died for you and I. And I want to close with this last verse in a story. And it says, Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so this word perfect may not be the best word to put here. Because when you think of perfect, you think of you know, sinless, that your character is perfect. But you know, another way you could use this word perfect is mature. And even mature, I don't even know if I like this word, so I want to share with you a story. And I'm talking to my fathers out here. So my fathers, you've been through birthdays and Christmas, and during Christmas, you know, your kids, they open those boxes, and they get those toys that need batteries. And so for my fathers out there, I don't know why, but the toy companies are evil, because they never have batteries with the toys, right? And so you have to go and you have to get batteries. But not only that, sometimes they use the weirdest little screws for these batteries. And you have to go and take out your whole toolbox. And you go and you find one. No, that's too big. Ah, oh, that one's too little. Oh, this is flat. That's not going to work. And finally, you find the perfect screwdriver for the job. Why is the screwdriver perfect? Because it fulfilled the mission that it needed to do. My friends, how are you and I perfect? If we fulfill the mission that God has given us. And God has given us this mission from the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 1. Let us make man in our own image. In the image of God. God created man. My friends, we were created to show the world who Jesus Christ is. We were created to love others. And my friends, as we start this new year, I want to be a Christian to mean something again. I want when people to see me, to see the Savior who's living in me, don't you? And my friends, the only way we can do that is by every single day surrendering our whole life to Jesus Christ. Because if we love God, we will love others. And as we love others in a radical way, the world will look around and they will say, I don't know what they have, but I want it. Will you pray with me? Dearly Father, Lord our God, Lord, you are so amazing. Lord, you love us so much. And Lord, my prayer today and for all of us, Lord, is that Lord, you help teach us to love others as much as you love us. Lord, as we look out in this neighborhood, in this community, Lord, there are people who are struggling, who are in pain, and Lord, who just need you. And Lord, I just pray that, Lord, you open our eyes, that you help us to live a radical faith, for Lord, we love others as you love us. Lord, just thank you so much for your love and for having your son, Jesus Christ, die on the cross for us. We love you, Lord, and thank you for loving us. In your name I pray. Amen.